Hi guys, welcome back. This is Mad Chat, episode 433, featuring part three of my interview with the great George Zeitz. Uh, in this part of the interview, we talk about the value, the true value of expansion packs, why they might actually be better uh, than the game they're supposedly designed to expand. Uh, we talk about how to craft a really tight and coherent narrative uh, for CRPGs. Uh, how to balance uh, choices in games, how many to put in, and how to uh, interweave those. We talk a, a little bit about behind-the-scenes stuff with uh, Mask of the Betrayer. Uh, George is uh, probably his uh, most popular game. Uh, and then we talk about small versus large studios, uh, the types of uh, environments that George likes to work in, and much, much more. Anyway, i got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. George Zeitz. Well, this is... This this goes nicely with the theme, I think, of uh, when we're going from these big games and the like. Neverwinter Nights one, Neverwinter Nights two, the big scope, the big uh, epic campaign to something more manageable, really, which is the concept of the expansions. Mm. You know, and some people think of it almost sounds like a well, it's just an ex it's just an expansion pack. <laughs> that seems to be the attitude. Whereas I think about it as no, this is really where you see uh, what these engines are capable of. You know, yeah. you're, you're finally getting, uh, you know, folks in there that can really concentrate on building a good game, a good narrative. You know, all the sort of mechanical stuff, I guess, has been done already. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm we, we, we Neverwinter Nights, nice. we got Hordes of the Under, Underdark, uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, obviously, Mask of the Betrayer. Mm-hmm. So, really, this is where the um, core part of the game is. Yeah, well, I mean, like, so Trent, Trent talked about that in, in his interview, and... and he's absolutely right like a lot of times as these games are being made they're also creating their tech mm -hmm. um and you don't necessarily know what the combat system is going to be you're like making the game and you know maybe the combat system isn't going to quite fit with what you're doing um and you're building levels and you don't even have all the tools to build the levels yet right so halfway through or three quarters of the way through the game you're like oh now we can layer in all the whatever like there's all this there's things that these skill checks we couldn't even use them and now mm -hmm. we sort of have to throw them all in at the end so Oftentimes, the the core game is not as strong as the expansion or the DLC. Um, that absolutely happened with Mask. Uh, it happened with Dungeon Siege. Like people talk about Dungeon Siege Three, um, that game really got like we hit our stride on the expansion for Dungeon Siege Three. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew that because <laughs> because like most people weren't too crazy about the original Dungeon Siege Three when we sort of were figuring out how to make one of these games, and then in the expansion we knew how to do it. And it was a lot better, but you know, by that point, you're limited by the sales of the original game because people typically don't buy the game for the expansion. Um, and it always happens, you know. That it, it, you are absolutely right that um, the expansion is where the team is hitting their stride yeah. and they know what they're doing, and they can just focus on making content as opposed to building out all these systems. Yeah, that's really the key problem. People should buy the game for the expansion. Yeah, you know, if they if they knew what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is, though, um, like Mask was Mask was a very different situation. Um, we were our original goal was to build kind of a hack and slasher, just something really simple. Um, just put something out there. You know, it'll be a little wow. bit of an expansion for the, like, <laughs> that was the that was the vision for Mask. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. The vision for Mask was uh, so I'll back up a little bit um, when we finished or when we were almost finished with Neverwinter Nights uh, we were told there was going to be an expansion Chris Avalone I am forever grateful to him uh, he came to me and he said I think you'd be a really good person to be the narrative lead on the new uh, expansion and I was like sweet I would love to do that awesome. um, and there would not have been a mask if he had not had faith in me to do that but um, I started coming up with the story very early uh, but the vision for it, like uh, Kevin Saunders, who was the, the project lead on it, um, like when he, his original his original marching orders from, I guess, publishers, execs, whatever it was, was just like quick hack and slash kind of adventure. You have six months to make the game, um, you know, just just get it done and, and move on. And I, and I was like, 
I will create something ten times. Yeah, bigger sorry to disappoint you with something much better, but uh... yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and it, it was <laughs> it was very much a case mm. of like, we will take your six months and work, you know, twelve, fourteen hour days and make something much better than that. Um, but that was not at all what was demanded or expected. You know, mask was something that that was the team. That was a team passion thing. You know, that came from us. That was not coming from the directive on the game. Hmm, that's really interesting. So basically, the whole thing is the product of overachievers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and and to Kevin's eternal credit, like he was the one who allowed me to do that. Like I came to him with this giant story and like, mm-hmm. we're going to go to the wall, of the faithless and the astral plane and stand on the bones of dead gods. And he was, you know, he was like, cool, let's do that. <laughs> Whereas a lot of project leads would probably have been like, you need to tone it down. Let's just do something simple. You know, I, Kevin's really good about trusting the people that work for him, mm-hmm. which is like more people should do that. Um, and he trusted me and he trusted the other people in the project who were excited about it. And, and so we got masks. Yeah, I think it's almost, and I always encourage people to tell me that they're, if they're interested in designing an RPG or making a making an RPG, you know, play mask of the betrayer and really, you know, play Sweet. it, play it a couple times and then just play it just to study, like how everything comes together. You know, I even noticed myself when I'm playing it over again, I, I just played it, you know, for videos, I guess a couple months ago. And I, I hadn't really paid that much attention to the stuff that happens like right when you spawn in the game and there's like those pillars you can touch and you see some visions. Yep. It's like a skeleton there. And it's like you don't really realize the significance of all that until maybe the second playthrough for me. Yep. A little slower on the uptake sometimes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that was intended. That was but then you, 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 know, you realize like how much it, everything is intended, right? It's all... Uh, nothing's random or just there just carrying you away, distracting you, uh, distracting you some way. Uh, but, you know, the more I think about it, the rarer that is. Mm-hmm. Um, every quest in that game, uh, I was adamant, had to somehow support the main narrative uh, or support characters who were critical to the main narrative, uh, companions. I mean, to some extent, we had the luxury of doing that because uh, it was a focused game. It was an expansion, and it didn't have to be 60 hours of gameplay. Um, it could be, It could be as long as we wanted it to be uh or as short as we we wanted it to be and we cut like originally there was a little bit more um like there was a uh there was like a whole module like the the merkel thing where you were standing in the astral plane on that big uh that big like stone and he's his bones are embedded in it like there was that was a whole module like you were going to be doing other things there uh, and we were like yeah we don't really need that all you really need is the merkel scene and that's that's sufficient so we cut all that like we cut everything that was not critical to telling that story and it way better for that like we don't have filler quests every side quest in there is somehow involved in telling that central story or supporting that theme Uh, you know i wish i wish we were able to do that in more games yeah i think that's really what it's the tightness of it and the coherence of it and the you know i think the more i think about it the more i'm starting to think as much as we think that we want these 60 plus hour (laughs) massive scale games maybe what we if we had to sense what we would want is something that's a lot smaller and shorter, but much richer on the development mm-hmm. side. So it's almost like, I don't want to just say less is more, but because it's, it's really not a case of being less. It's just it's a question of, uh, I guess, a smaller scope, but doing more with the scope. Yeah, I mean, smaller and tighter. Um, right. That's why like a lot of indie games now are doing a much better job of storytelling than the big AAA games. Um, I mean, AAA games, there are some really great linear stories. Um, there's obviously fantastic graphics. But like a lot of the open world uh, AAA games, they suffer from like all these like goofy little quests that have nothing to do with anything. And it's like I'm running off in Skyrim and I'm doing guild stuff and I'm like helping people find their pants or <laughs> <laughs> Collect 12 bear asses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, what am I supposed to, what's the main story again? Like what's, how is this all thematically united? And I just sort of lose the thread of what the game is all about. Um, Whereas like in a really solid indie, and there's a lot of them out there, like you never forget what the game is all about. Like, you know, things can be much more focused. Nobody cares if it's a six hour game. Like if you are buying an indie for five bucks and it's a really great focused six hour story experience. Great. Mm -hmm. Like that's a, that's a fantastic value. Um, And I find myself, drawn more to indie narratives nowadays 
than to a lot of the bigger games. Mm-hmm. That's a, I guess in some ways, like movies, we think, well, we could have added another six hours on to that movie. But <laughs> 60 right. hours, but, you know, would it have been better for that? Uh, but I want to dive in a little bit. In some ways, uh, George, I almost feel like you're the magician who's showing us all the, the tricks, like how you do the tricks. <laughs> You know, because this is something I thought a lot about, too. Just, you know, we have all these great writers out there, great imaginations, great stories. But the challenge, I think, is how do you adapt that for a game? You know, there's there's a lot to talk about there. And you talked, the way you sum it up here is the uh, choke points and key story moments you say the secret is careful control. Important choices, the ones that were really meaningful, were only offered at a few critical moments in the storyline. I made mm-hmm. certain that every player would pass through those choke points in order to progress through, through the game. Uh, so that sounds really smart. I just wonder if you could kind of uh, break that down for <laughs> somebody that's like, you know, I got to, I want to make an RPG. I want to have a good story. I want to do this. But, you know, how, how do I do that? Yeah, no, I mean, so on Mask, there were a lot of different ways we could have gone about it. Um, What I really wanted to do was I wanted to have great reactivity in that game to the player's choices. And you can't do that if you have a gazillion different choices and the player can just go anywhere and do anything at any time and they can make these choices at any point in the game. It's very hard because you very quickly end up with an exponential amount of branching and this person could go here first and then they could go there first and who knows what's going to happen. It just it, it gets washed out. Um, a problem that we always talked about like in Exile was like, how do we surface these choices to the player? Like, how do we tell the player that that choice they made, like, this is happening because they did that? A lot of games don't do that. Like, a lot of times there is a lot of reactivity in games, but you don't even realize it because you think that this thing would have happened no matter what. Um, And they don't really, they're not really showing you that, oh, it's because you did this thing. So what we did was we said, okay, we're going to have a few big choices And a lot of things are going to depend on those choices. Um, So if you look at, I won't be too spoilery if people haven't played Mask yet, but the first choice is Oku, right? The the big bear god. So you're you're fighting Oku outside the gates of the city. You have a choice to either um, suppress your power, your spirit-eating power, and not eat him, um, or destroy and devour him. Ha ha ha, vengeance, you're a pain in the ass, I'm going to destroy you. Um, There are tons of things that respond to that. Um, and we did it in a lot of different modalities, too. So there are quest things that respond to it. Uh, there you get a, your companion is different. Like you could either have Oku as a companion or you unlock this other companion. Um, there are just like a lot of different ways. There's dialogue stuff. There's, um, you know, when you when you talk to the next big thing, the woodman, like that plays out very differently. Um, we didn't do this, but another way you could do it in you know, a visual changes. Like what I often tell people is if you want to have a choice that feels very consequential, respond to it in as many different ways as you can. Mm. Uh, And then remind the player, like have the NPC say, you destroyed Oku, so I am not letting you in here. And the player will immediately be like, okay, if I hadn't destroyed Oku, I wonder if this person would be acting very differently toward me. And then they play it again and they're like, oh, look at this, it's a completely different Mm. quest. Um, Like that is what we wanted to do. And we really just had, a lot of little bits of reactivity, but we really just had like a few choices in that game that then played out with a lot of consequences in the next, like, say, you know, five, ten hours of the game. There was just lots of stuff that responded to it. Yeah, it reminds me of the kind of what we were talking about before in this this older gameplay style where you would expect to play a game not just once. You know, but go back and play it three, four times, maybe once a, once a year. And so yep. don't, don't you worry. I guess, you know, to play devil's advocate for a minute. You know, somebody says, well, if I'm only going to play this once, I'm only going to see, you know, uh, 50% of the content because I didn't go down this other path. You know, so what do you... It, so I, I think it's... I, I don't think it necessarily matters whether you whether you play it again or not. Like, I think there are people who will be super passionate and they'll go through and it's like, oh, look you know, at I that. See what, I want to see what that other path was like. Right. I mean, I, good God, I like, I will always save before a dialogue and then <laughs> Me play <too. laughs> like 10 different times just to see like all the different paths and, or boo if they had like, if I, if I pick the other thing and they says exactly the same thing. Um, but like, I think even players who play through it once, if you are constantly reminding them 
that they made this choice and this is why this is happening. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they feel more like, okay, this is my story. I'm shaping this story. Like they are talking about the things I did and they're reacting to it. You know, I'm walking down the street and like some random NPCs are like, did you hear, you see what that guy did? Blah, blah, blah. Um, even like the, the minor NPCs we, uh, in, in mask of the betrayer, like the little, just like little junk, um, ambient guys are like walking around the streets you may not have noticed this, but like a lot of them have different lines based upon what you did. Um, so they'll be like, if you ate Oku, they're like, you are you're against the spirits. I hate you. Or if you spared Oku and he's there, he's like, ah, friend of the bear God. You know, so there's like there's a lot of yeah. reactivity in lots of different ways. Yeah, that's it. You know, somebody who does write a lot of dialogue. Uh, how many dialogue options? You know, is there a sweet spot there? Because I remember I played several games where it seems like there's like 14 options there. <laughs> that just seems like too much, but... It, it is. Uh, um, so it, it depends on the game. Um, so there's games where, um, you know, maybe three is kind of the sweet spot. I would say three is probably the... Two to three is probably the, the lower limit. Um, I think you could get up to five to six in some games and not feel too overwhelmed. Like I think Planescape Torment, you know, they get away with five or six. When it goes over five or six, I think you <laughs> like. Yeah, there's a certain point where you feel like you're doing too much reading. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I think it, there's also just like, there's also just being overwhelmed mm-hmm. with the number of choices that you're looking at. Um, and also like if you're if you're in one of those like interrogation dialogues, and you talk to a guy, and then he says, "What would you like to ask me?" And there's ten different options. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to click on all of them. Uh, so there is this, like, I, I would say three to five is the sweet spot. Man, I'm, I'm so with you on that. Now, one, of the, uh, one of the things you said about this is that it's harder to do this properly if you're working in a big studio. Yep. And I think this is Zad's interview on, on, the, code, on the Codex, RPG Codex. And you're talking about it's it's really tough. You got all these different disciplines. Everybody's specialized. You got one person just doing combat, another person doing uh, uh, the writing and the story. So one person doing all the item descriptions. <laughs> <laughs> and so again, a thus digimancy. But uh, you know, it sounds like there's just to, to me, it just sounds like there's so many advantages to being a small studio. That I don't know even know why so, anybody would want to work for those other ones. Well, job security is a big one. Um, <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, so, so a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the the game studios that we are accustomed to and that we know really well, and they're part of big conglomerates now. Um, you know, Obsidian, Bioware, uh, Harebrain, like you know, they all started out as as independent studios, um, and they have been bought up by Microsoft or whatever. Uh, and a lot of that is, you know. Like guys like Brian who had to keep hustling for the next project, like they feel so much, they're so much happier now where it's like, I can just focus on making games. Um, And there are people that like coming into work every day and just doing that one thing. Like I know writers who are like, I am happy just writing dialogue all day, every day. I am cool with that. Give me dialogue. I will do it. Um, Me? No. Like I want, <laughs> I want lots of different things to do. And there are other people like me, uh, yeah. Tony Evans, who I worked with at Obsidian for a long time. Like he's a guy that's, he's a generalist. Like you just can't take the generalist out of him. And now he's a studio design director at Volition. Um, so there are those of us who, you know, our creativity kind of requires doing a lot of different things. And then there's people who don't mind doing that same thing. And of course, like I said, you know, the, the benefit you get is, you're at a big company, you got good benefits, you know, all the stuff your mom talked to you about, right? You know, and you're working in games and I got, got the, the those are my curtains in Dragon Age. Yeah. I did that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I'm the curtain it, guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean and and yeah. to be fair, I mean that there is, you know, that is creativity. Uh and okay. you know, you can can be you can be proud of of if you if you love doing that one thing, there's nothing wrong with it. Um but if you want to do something, you know, really original and you want to step out of you know, a lot of times at these big companies a lot of it's determined by a marketing department or a, you know a panel of executives somewhere that you are never going to interact with and you just just kind of hand it down here's the vision for the game make it happen um and some people are cool with that and some people aren't you know if you want to do original stuff it's very hard to do that at a big studio yeah i think that's you know something i've come across a 
a lot of your interviews you talk about how much you enjoy collaborating with the artists and the programmers and how rich that is and it just it's almost sad to me to think about everybody just being in a cubicle and being so being left out so, of any big picture discussions the the team like when creativity comes from the team it's fantastic like if you have, I actually, I got this sense from Disco Elysium, right? Like Disco Elysium doesn't have a marketing department. They don't have like a panel of executives telling them what to do. It was very much like a vision of a small number of people. They all shared it. I, my sense is they all contributed to it. Um, and then they made this thing that they came up with, right? And it sounds like it's a really great thing. A Mask of the Betrayer, very much a similar situation um, where, you know, I had the story and, you know, I was very attentive to how can we make sure everybody kind of has their thing, right? Mm -hmm. Something that they have an ownership over. So it was like, here's some story, you know, here's what has to happen in your zone. It's like one or two things, everything else, have fun, make Ashenwood as great as it can be. And it's your vision, Eric Fenstermaker. And he went off and he did that. And you know, it, it's so much better than if I had said, it has to be this and this and this and this, and just make it like he brought Eric Fenstermaker to Ashenwood and the, uh, and the Academy. And it's much better because of that. Um, so when the creativity is coming from the team, you can come up with such brilliant stuff. And I, I wish more, um, big studios would recognize that and, and, uh, arrange things that way instead of like executives who have nothing to do with the game, just sort of coming in and micromanaging things. And it's like, uh, it's not going to come up with brilliant stuff that way. You know, was that you sent me a note about how you didn't like the open office layout or what was that? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Open that. offices, they need to be banned. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, so the most, the most fun, and the least production, least productivity I've ever had, uh, was at Turbine uh, Entertainment, which I worked it was like 2004, 2005, um, like Lord of the Rings Online, D and D Online. So that mm. studio was basically three giant rooms. And the entire team was just in this huge room and there were no cubicle walls, it was just desks and people were having Nerf gun fights and, <laughs> and, and Frank calling each other and playing music. And like there were some artists who would like drink beer as they were doing their work. And it was just this, it was chaos and it was really fun, but it was not productive. Um, and it was like, I think there are disciplines that can work pretty well in an open office. Like I think artists can work pretty well um, in situations where I've been a level designer and it's like using a different part of your brain. Like you're not using the verbal part of your brain. Like I could kind of do that. Yeah. Oh my God. If you're trying to write dialogue or come up with story or like, I think programmers have a lot of trouble with this. Like you need your own space. And I, I feel so bad when we take writers and we stick them into a big room of people talking. Like you can just see their spirits dying and they're <laughs> sitting there yeah. trying to like, you know, write dialogue and it's, they're obviously getting distracted constantly. So yeah, if I had anything to say to people who own a studio, like let your writers and your programmers and any, or anyone else who like introverts, like people who sort of need that privacy to do good, to great work and be focused, like don't force them into an open office. Like, Give them some like little cubicle space or like their own little private offices or let them work from home. It's so critical to getting work done. Yeah, I'm definitely that way. It's just the writing that I do. I <laughs> I want I don't even want to have music playing. I mean I need like total yeah. isolation. Yeah. It's what a nightmare too. to be constantly interrupted while I'm right in the middle of a thought. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a, uh, I go, what is this, a fourth installment? I got enough for at least uh, two more episodes uh, with George, so stay tuned. A lot of great, great stuff coming up. Uh, I mean, this guy is just fantastic. I hope you've been enjoying these. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your support of the show, for Matt Chet helping us. Uh, uh, me uh, have conversations like this with George and getting them up on uh, YouTube and sharing these uh, these insights, very valuable stuff. I hope you'll agree. And I couldn't do it without you. Uh, so thanks so much for your support. And if you, know, if you haven't done so already, please go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Uh, you can become a Ratron and be involved in Matt Chat, helping to keep these episodes in production. You know, and while you're doing that, uh, take a minute, if you will, and uh, write a little note. always love to hear about uh, you know, who you are, a little bit about your interest, where you came from, 
Uh, I just got one from a guy who's a, a new dad, you know, so congratulations to him. I don't know if he wants me to share his personal info or not, but, <laughs> you know, I, I every now and then I hear from somebody who says they watch the show uh, with, their, with their kid or kids in some cases, and I always think that's fantastic, kind of passing on the a love of this stuff to the uh, newer generations. I have a lot of really fond memories myself of gaming with uh, my dad and my mom, too. We're kind of a gaming family. Uh, even back, I guess that would have been like the early 80s. So uh, anyway, keep that up. If you're a parent, I think your kids will probably look back one day and, and have good memories of that. All right, let's see. Uh, what else? Uh, before we get to the news, I do have some more copies here. I ordered uh, 10 copies. I'm still waiting on the one that got damaged, a <laughs> replacement for that. But uh, I got Dungeons and Desktops here. It's probably the, uh, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb here and just call it the best uh, print book anyway you're going to find. About the history of computer role-playing games, full color, you know, big labor of love. Me and uh, Shane Stacks worked our butts off on this. Uh, totally up to date. It's fantastic stuff. If you like this channel, uh, you're going to want this book. Now, you can get it from Amazon, but I've, uh, like I say, I ordered some of my own copies so I could uh, sign those. And I want to uh, sign one for you and ship it with a free uh, Matt Chat bonus coin. These are really awesome collectible coins. Really heavy. I mean, it's really more of a medallion uh, than a coin. Uh, the same guy that did the artwork on the cover, Robbie Sam, but did the uh, the coin art as well. I think you really like both of those. And I even throw in a little, uh, I keep forgetting to bring one out here, but a little silk pouch to keep your coin in. <laughs> so, uh, keep it from getting uh, scratched up. But uh, anyway, just go to that link in the show notes. I think I got maybe uh, seven, six or seven copies left. Uh, same price, basically, as you get them on Amazon. And I even have the uh, Global Partners shipping thing set up for you international guys. So uh, go check that out. Really want you to get these. And if you got one already, <laughs> uh, they make a good holiday gift to may maybe get one for your kid. Uh, or, uh, you know, maybe you got an anniversary coming up. I was just thinking how romantic it would be uh, to give them a copy of this book. Uh, <laughs> of course, give Elizabeth... <laughs> My wife won every year for our anniversary. She just really loves that. I'm just kidding, folks. All right. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, your wife or husband, if they're into gaming, I'd I, I love to sign one for them. I can uh, dedicate it however you like, even draw a little heart there on it for you. So uh, whatever it is, guys, uh, just let me know. We can make it happen. All right. What about that news for the Mad Cave? Well, a lot of stuff here. Uh, one uh, turn-based gamer uh, tweeted this to me, sort of replied to a tweet about it, or however that works. Anyway, it was cool learning about this game called Shard Punk Vermin Fall. Shard Punk Vermin Fall. Uh, there's a tech de demo of, uh, available now of this game. It's an upcoming tactical squad-based survival strategy game based in a steampunk setting. Gameplay-wise, it's a mix of XCOM and Darkest Dungeon games, mixing the best features from both, all in a lovely pixel art uh, wrapping. And this is what a TBG, or turn-based gaming, has to say about it. He says, uh, I assume it's a he. <laughs> uh, maybe I should check that out. Uh, anyway, they say, it's definitely in the early stages, but the developer is open for feedback. At its core, turn-based tactical combat gameplay feels good, just needs some tweaks. I really like the theme of fighting off hordes of rat men. <laughs> yes, I definitely need to check that out. But anyway, uh, the tech demo is available now. Shard Punk Vermin, Vermin Fall, go check it out. I also saw this, this is pretty cool. Fancy Dungeons and Dragons dice set featuring a gym grown by science. <laughs> there's, like, there's like a nerd overload here. I mean, we got the D&D, the, the D20 uh, gyms grown by science. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, anyway, this is to celebrate 45, the 45th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons. So the Wizards of the Coast put this together. The fanciest of all dice sets with a lab-grown sapphire 
And why a sapphire? Well, they think they have a reason for that. They say when the D&D team realized that the sapphire is the traditional anniversary stone for both five years and 45 years, and that adding a lab-created sapphire to a 20-sided die wouldn't jeopardize the integrity of a roll, that's a good point. We couldn't pass it up. That's Nathan Stewart, VP of the D&D franchise. Uh, so it's pricey. It's 300 bucks. <laughs> but my guess is it will pay for itself with just a few sessions of D&D. &D you know, I'm guessing you're going to get crit quite often on this $300 D20, uh, basically. Anyway, it's just a fantastic looking set. I, I don't have uh, that kind of disposable income myself, but uh, hey, you know, if you've got it, get, get yourself this uh, die set. Uh, post some pictures. I'd love to see you with it. Uh, I think you'd have a good time. Uh, and then finally, uh, Rick and Morty. Uh, if you watch that, I have to admit I'm totally unfamiliar with this. I see it. I don't even know. I've never watched an episode of it. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I saw this in the news. It was kind of interesting. Uh, so they've returned with the season four, and they have a bunch of corporate tie-ins, one of which is a D&D &D game. And it's based on a comic book crossover series about Rick's adventures as a power-hungry dungeon master. It's created by Kate Welch, a Wizards of the Coast game designer and a Rick and Morty fan. Uh, so you can read this guy's experience of uh, playing this. He says it's uh, really kind of zany. It really brings out the, uh, the butthole <laughs> in players, and I guess in a good way. Uh, he talks about the uh, being a, let's see, there was a line in here. Maybe I didn't write it down. Oh, uh, the game has been made with new players in mind as well as experienced players looking to take a break and try something intentionally ridiculous. So he said it's a lot of fun, especially for DMs. Kind of plays up the uh, the power mad uh, DM and the godlike power of the role. Uh, anyway, I'm not like I said, I don't know about Rick and Morty, but I figure some of you folks might be interested in that. Uh, so I'll post a link to that as well. All right, I think that will do it for the news. I know you're kind of curious about this shirt. <laughs> I, I wanted to show you this. This is something I got back, uh, God, what was this? It must have been a birthday gift and back in August. And I've kind of been playing with it. It is a guitar. Well, let's see if I can get it to work. Guitar shirt. Let's see. Why? There we go. <laughs> And it actually, you're supposed to be able to cord it. There we go. It's a it's a t-shirt guitar. I mean, what are you expecting? You know, I'd love to be able to play some Maiden on this. I just not that talented yet. You know, it doesn't sound bad for a t-shirt. <laughs> you know, it's actually got a little amp here. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, you can control the volume and the tone. Let's see what the tone does. It's gonna play around with that. I'll crank it all the way to 11. <laughs> the volume actually goes to 11. <laughs> Alright, so that's... It's like all the way up. Let's do it all the way down. No, it's not bad. Not bad at all. It even has a little output thing. So anyway, this is a little gift from Think Geek. The lo my lovely wife Elizabeth got this for me, so thank you very much, Elizabeth. <laughs> you know, and even just uh, I mean, just because we're kind of rocking out here, I think I mentioned that I went to the Minnesota largest uh, candy store in Minnesota the other day, and they also had a bunch of sodas. And, you know, since I don't drink alcohol anymore, I've been looking for uh, fun novelty sodas, you know, something that might be fun to try on the show. And they did not disappoint. I mean, they probably have more sodas than there are beers in the world. <laughs> it's just, it seemed like thousands to choose from. 
Uh, but I found this one I thought would be appropriate for a, a rock and roll inspired insubmission. This is John 5. It will make you want to shred. Limeade, made with pure cane soda. And it's very green. Let's see, does it say anything on here? I can't really make out much of this label. Apparently it's bottled by Rocket Fizz. Doesn't really say, there's some text on here, but it's too dark for me to make out. I just can't, honestly can't read what it says. But anyway, John 5, uh, let's get this open, pour it in the old drinking horn, and see what it's all about. All right, John 5. Twist off, ooh, kind of weird sort of steam like coming off of this thing. Wow, that's kind of cool. Looks a little bit like the liquid, uh, liquid nitrogen. I think that's what you see in movies sometimes when they want to... There's a little bit of funk around that bottle cap, where the bottle cap loot was. I don't know how long this has been sitting on the shelf. But, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and drink it anyway. I mean, you got to live dangerously. Whoa. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear this, but it's like... Whew. Definitely has a strong, like, apple aroma. Really, really fizzy. Man. <laughs> Smells good. Kind of like watermelon and apple. Kind of what you'd expect from a green soda. Uh, let's give it a taste. Wow. Uh, that's really good. Kind of tastes like those, uh, <clears throat> maybe like a really good <clears throat> watermelon, sort of a tart apple uh, snow cone. kind of what it reminds me of. Uh, I'll try it again. Hmm. Yeah, this is a really, really super good soda. I really like that. It's it's sweet, but it's not like overpowering. And there's a little more going on there. There's like a, some subtle uh, other flavors in this. I can't quite identify. I definitely taste a little bit of apple. It's not too sour. It's probably more sweet than sour. Yeah, limeade. Uh, so I guess that's what it's supposed to taste like, uh, like a sonic uh, limeade. I would say it actually tastes better than that, <laughs> at least to me. Uh, really good flavor on this. Uh, John 5, I'd go 5 out of 5 on this. You know, if you like a green soda. I wonder if it has caffeine in it. You know, it's just a shame. Maybe I can just sort of make this out if I really focus on it. Now, that's nutritional facts. <laughs> uh, no, just can't. Looks like these are the ingredients. Cane sugar... Man, they made this hard to read. That's about all I can make out is cane sugar. But anyway, uh, good stuff. It's a little freaky with that rust or boogers or whatever that is around the bottle <laughs> cap. You know, I guess that's probably just a little bit of rust maybe from where it's uh, sat there for too long. But anyway, thankfully did not affect the taste. And I'm not one of those guys. I'm kind of like, you know, people have the 12-second rule or whatever it is, five-second rule. I think <laughs> for me it's like a two-day rule. <laughs> you know, I guess I am kind of rat-like uh, rat -like in some ways. Anyway, uh, let's wrap this up with a quote. And I was looking up for quotes about staying focused and not getting distracted and, you know, getting your stuff done and uh, having to deal with uh, distractions and things. And I found this quote, and I just thought uh, this is perfect for this. It's a quote by Warren Buffett. And it goes something like this. Knowing what to leave out is just as important as knowing what to focus on. So ponder on that and see you guys next time.
Fed's department regrets to inform you that your sons are dead because they were stupid.